I absolutely love it when the choir begins the sermon before I do. Thank you all. Thank you. In 1893, the Pullman Palace Car Company, manufacturer of railroad cars, cut the already low wages of its workers by 25%. Not reduced were the workers' corresponding rents in the company-owned town of Pullman, outside of Chicago, where the workforce lived. As a result, many families faced starvation. Workers demanded to meet with the company's owner to protest poverty wages and 16-hour workdays. When refused and fired, the subsequent workers' strike and boycott managed to halt much of the Midwest's railway traffic for months. A year into the bitter conflict, President Grover Cleveland, for fear of losing the support of working-class voters, finally signed a bill into law making Labor Day a national holiday. It gave credence to a strong U.S. labor movement whose demands included such radical ideas as the eight-hour workday, safe working conditions, and an end to child labor. What on earth, we may be wondering, has any of this to do with our gospel reading today? Well, if we follow perhaps the most popular interpretation of Jesus' parable, maybe not much. In this allegorized telling, the landowner is understood to be God, and the laborers are those who accept God's invitation to the vineyard, understood to be heaven or the reign of God. The moral, it doesn't matter when you get there, only that you get there. Even arriving at the last possible hour, you receive the full reward. The point that all are radically loved and welcomed by God is an important one, vital, but totally unsurprising punchline for a parable. See, parables were meant to surprise, tease our imaginations into active wonder, and challenging us to understand the world differently and maybe reorder life as a result. Or as Kinonia Farms founder Clarence Jordan so aptly put it, whenever Jesus told a parable, he lit a stick of dynamite and covered it with a story. Is this parable more concerned with economics than end times? The parable could be about salvation, but I believe Jesus was more interested in how we love our neighbor than how we get into heaven. Or as Dr. Amy Jill Levine, whose work on this parable inspired this entire sermon, she wrote, to those who ask today, are you saved? Jesus might well respond, the better question is, do your children have enough to eat? Or do you have shelter for the night? This parable helps us ask the more pressing, more visceral questions, like, can we imagine the reign of God, not just as some future faraway place, but a dynamic, in-breaking reality in our present, right here among us, even between employers and employees? What is that like? The reign of God is like a landowner, Jesus begins and then goes on to describe what sounds like an ordinary scenario that plays out every day in California's Central Valley in avocado, orange, and almond groves. But it quickly gets odd as the landowner returns to the marketplace four more times, 9 a.m., noon, 3, and even 5 p.m., an hour before the workday ended, and then recruits everyone he finds, promising to pay them whatever is right. We don't know why they are so late and yet to be hired. Maybe they've been there since dawn, but were not chosen in the first several rounds of employment. They may have already worked another job or two. Perhaps they were taking care of aging parents or their young children. Perhaps they had come from a neighbor neighboring village where employment was lacking. When we read the Bible, the Bible reads us, and perhaps through this parable is searching for our grace for workers, especially low-wage and migrant workers, many whose stories we don't know, 
and of whom we are often quick to judge. Whatever the reason, they've not been called in. The laborers are not asked to defend themselves. Instead, they are given a job, thereby preserving their dignity, and given a day's wage, thereby preserving their ability to feed their families. I can imagine the landowner resonating with Cesar Chavez when he said, I'm angry that I live in a world where someone who picks food for a living can't afford to feed their family. Or the haunting, wildly relevant words of Dolores Huerta, Every single day we sit down to eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and at our table we have food that was planted, picked, or harvested by a farm worker. Why is it that the people who do the most sacred work in our nation are the most oppressed, the most exploited? The next thing this parable blows up is the compensation process. Those hired last who worked only an hour get a full day's pay. Those hired first get the same, exactly as they'd negotiated that morning. This isn't fair, they grumble, now expecting more. These last have worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But the landowner answers their accusations with the question, Are you envious because I am generous? In her book, Reading Jesus, author Mary Gordon calls this an impossible question calling for an impossible honesty. Because yes, I am envious because my work has not been rewarded. I am envious because someone got away with something here. We know how the world works. Time is money, fair is fair. Equal pay for equal work is fair. Equal pay for unequal work is not fair. Our sympathies may strongly lie with those who worked harder than the latter hired. A feminist reading might advocate even more fervently as their story finds a contemporary analogy in the woman who settles for a set wage in doing factory work, for example, only to find that men hired after she began received the same amount of money for less work, or the all-too-common man with less experience and skill still receiving more pay. A womanist reading further amplifies the defense of the first hired, reminding us of the unconscionable pay disparities that still exist between white workers and workers of color today. We may even conclude that in setting up the first hire to resent their co-workers, the landowner has engaged in an early form of union busting. He has prevented the workers from uniting and so from protesting their exploitation. But the vineyard owner counters calmly, I've done you no injustice. I promised you what was right. And what is right is a living wage the equality of his payments, and his treating all the workers equally derives from a sense of justice keyed into what people need to live. The landowner not only fulfilled his contract to those first hired, he also paid a full wage to those who didn't expect it. The only case the workers have against him was that he was generous to others. And in making that point, the workers learn an important economic lesson. The point is not that those who have get more, but that those who have not get enough. One does the work in the labor force or in the already and not yet yet realm of God, not for more reward, but for the benefit of all. The next day, perhaps the first will be last, and those who grumble in the evening about bonuses will be desperate in the morning for any job at all. Last year, the L.A. labor movement led and experienced what became known as Hot Labor Summer. It's a flurry of strikes and unionizing among hotel workers, service workers at LAX, 
actors, writers, producers, IATSE movie set crew, UPS, LAUSD support staff, healthcare workers, and many others. Caroline Luce of UCLA said of this moment that has continued strongly throughout 2024 that it has been characterized by a strong sense of solidarity among workers across fields, showing up as they have been on each other's picket lines and using social media for awareness and support of each other's campaigns. Their radical demands have included living wages, that one job should be enough, at least eight hours between shifts to rest, the dignity of living near one's work, or that one shouldn't have to choose between four hours of daily commuting or substandard housing because decent housing is unaffordable, a bitter reality that workers of Unite Here Local 11 have shared with me. According to MIT's living wage calculator, the living wage in Los Angeles for a single parent with one child is $43.81 an hour. And on average, hotel workers make around $25 an hour. Many housekeepers earn closer to $20. And yet, contracts are being won across Southern California, guaranteeing higher wages, better pensions, and increased investments in health care. Of the movement, Carolyn Luce writes again, I certainly think workers are feeling this increased sense of, if we don't fight now, what future do we have? Perhaps this is an urgent question for our community as well, and one the parable asks too. Some of us are among those I've named today. Several are facing another month of unemployment others freshly facing it for the first time, and others are fighting for dignity and equality in their jobs. And still, so many of our neighbors can't afford rent and healthy food. Perhaps landowners and employers, people and communities of means are to find an example in Jesus' parable, a generosity that mirrors God's who acts generously toward all, inviting and ensuring people have what they need to live. In this world of unjust economic realities, and in a world where people can't find jobs that pay living wages, while others have excess and excessive funds, heeding the challenges of this parable are vital. Now, I don't think that means we treat it as an economic handbook. As Tom Long writes, any company that paid people who work one hour a day the same as it paid its full-time workers would soon have a hard time finding employees willing to show up at 9 a.m. Even so, the parable works on our imaginations in ways that have profound implications for economic justice. It allows us to enter for a moment into this alternate world one that operates on generosity rather than greed, ambition, and competition. It allows us to experience a world in which those who are ignored, idle, and discarded by society are nevertheless deemed of utmost value, worthy, regardless of their circumstances, to live with dignity each day. After letting our imaginations dwell in the surprising generosity of this parable and of the divine, we can no longer look at parking lots filled with farm workers or marketplaces with expectant laborers who are paid unjustly and who are viewed as disposable and rest easy. How might we honor this Labor Day and workers this year? As a community, maybe we'll continue to generously support Food at First and our growing community gardens and urban farm, both of which ease the high burden of food costs that create spaces for learning and empowerment and where we remind each other of our dignity. Maybe we'll continue insisting the minimum wage be increased to keep pace with the astronomical cost of living. Maybe we'll celebrate each other's wins knowing their win and their win 
and their win is our win. And give thanks others have what they need to truly live. Whatever we choose, we'll see ancient words continue to leap off of pages, break into our present, giving us a glimpse of the reign of God, and like a stick of dynamite has gone off beneath them, and they dance before our very eyes. May it be so. Amen. <laughs>